It wasn't until midnight when we stopped to get gas and to get some coffee to stay awake and stretch our legs. And in the cafe on the motorway, we saw the newspapers. In 1967, an event that lasted just a few seconds created a series of photos that have lasted a few generations. The images depict a group of marathon runners, and between them, an angry official charging at the single female runner wearing bib number 261. The official is Jock Semple, one of the directors of the race. The race itself is the Boston Marathon. The female, Catherine Switzer, who was just 20 years old at the time and the first woman to be officially running the race. This moment of drama was captured and, as a result, immortalized, not just because of its intensity, but because of what it has come to represent. Hello, Harry here, and welcome to Jog On. A short while ago, I was in the very fortunate position to be able to speak with the woman wearing bib number 261 that day, Catherine herself. Catherine is now in her early 70s and currently residing in New Zealand. As I scribbled a note, Catherine noticed... Oh good, you're a left-hander. I am, yeah, yeah. Me too. She asked about how this Jog On episode would be produced. Are we video or are we just audio? So I create one video and one audio. It's a great question. I put my video lipstick channel. on just in case. Brilliant. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> we talked about many things, including Catherine's discovery of a passion for running. I was just utterly fascinated with the distance. Just, it was like I could run forever. She gave her perspective on that infamous moment. Because he was out of control. He was wow. out of control. We went on to talk about what she's been doing in the last 52 years since that day, as well as the moment she finally discovered the place where it all happened after decades of searching. When I started running, instantly it came and I said, this is it. Catherine is surely the most well-known guest I've had on the podcast thus far, and she was a pleasure to speak with. She has many years of experience both in distance running and in particular women's running. If you're listening to the podcast right now and you would like to watch this episode, you can go to the YouTube channel Jog On Podcast with Harry Morgan and find the video version there. So please, welcome to Jog On, Catherine Switzer. You're training with Arnie Briggs and that very first conversation where he suggests that women, of course, can't run uh, the marathon. Did that make you feel inspired to do it? Did it make you slightly angry? Was that the initial thing that made you think, no, I'm going to go and try and do this? Yeah, absolutely. It was amazing. We were out running in a blizzard, Arnie Briggs and I, uh, in Syracuse, New York, where it's always having a blizzard. He had been telling me for the last four months about his running the Boston Marathon and how it made him the hero in his own life one day a year. And he was willing to give everything to this race and he'd run it 15 times. And so, you know, to me, I was hearing about the Olympian gods, you know, when I'm talking to Arnie. And, and then I said, well, I'd like to run it too. And he said, but a woman can't run it. And, and then we argued and, and mm -hmm. I got really indignant. And I, and I said, what are you talking about? A woman ran it last year. Roberta Gibb jumped out of the bushes, ran the race. And he said, no Dane ever ran no marathon. And actually, there were about six women in history who had done it. And then we argued, and I said, you don't have a training buddy if you, if you don't believe I can do it. And he, oh, you know, okay. He said, finally, you know, if you show me in practice, I'll be the first person to take you. It was one of those kind of parental lines, you know, how you do with your kids. Yeah. Um, and so we trained up, and and the day came in to, to run the distance. And we we ran the distance, and he was so impressed. And he said wow, I'm just so impressed. And I said, you know, but I don't think we've done the distance and let's run another 8K. And, and he said, you can do another 8K, and I, you know, five miles. And I said, sure, can't you? And we went out for 30. So now it's a 31 mile run, 50Ks. And, um, and he passed out at the end of the workout. <laughs> <laughs> so then he was utterly convinced. So that, that is apocryphal because from that, we were beginning to suspect this, but all along we were beginning to feel that maybe women were different. Uh, in terms of having more endurance and stamina and and that's what's been proving out now in sports and especially in ultra running so we kind of discovered that 54 years ago yeah. and i was just utterly fascinated with the distance just it was like I could run forever. That's, yeah. That was the greatest feeling. There is something fascinating about going to those longer distances. It almost becomes a slightly spiritual practice when you go to those real long distances. It's, uh, it's quite something. It is. It's, I'm glad you feel that way. I absolutely do feel that. I mean, I, mean, I get kind of, you know, it's the only time I kind of get um, what I call airy-fairy, which is like, you know, one with nature, get totally lost. I mean, 
you know, four hours out in the woods or up in the mountains here in New Zealand where I am right now. Unbelievable for me. Gets me out of my, my own space and gets me into something else. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's almost a slightly zen. On that day then, when you go to Boston Marathon, one of the questions I had for you, Catherine, was, was there already a fear of you're quite aware I'm the only woman here. Like, am I going to get found out? Will they stop me from getting into the race? Will they try and drag me out? Was that a fear on your mind or did you try and put that to one side? It was a slight fear, but but not really because, see, guys had been always really welcoming to me in running. It mm. was completely different from every other sport. And I think we all will admit that, that, that running is one of the most inclusive and diverse sports uh, in the world and, and activities. It's, it's, it's beyond sport, actually. Um, because we all feel that kind of, I think, spirituality. Anybody who runs seriously feels that. The team at Syracuse had always been welcoming to me. When I showed up at Boston, the guys were wonderful. This is, this is something people have to understand, is that it was only the officials who gave me a hard time. But the guys themselves who were running, they were coming up to me and saying, I wish my wife would run. I wish my girlfriend would run. Can you give me some tips to get her started? She's really just not interested. And I can't, I just think she would love it so much. And, um, and I was really happy. And, and that relieved my nervousness. I was nervous about the race anyway, though. I mean, as anybody is before a marathon, especially your first big one mm. in Boston. I was also, it was a funny day. I was completely, everybody was completely blindsided by the weather. It turned out to be the worst conditions in the history of the Boston Marathon up to 2018. Utterly miserable. So you were soaked to the skin. And we had, everybody had on everything they owned. So that was one of the things that, that really changed history, is that instead of wearing my cute little shorts and top that I had on, I was in a heavy uh, gray sweatsuit with gloves. But the guys all knew I was a woman. I, I wasn't trying to hide. Yeah, um, and in fact, when I pinned on my number, I felt really really proud. And, and I, I said to Arnie, when I got the number, I said, you know, I'm going to be noticed here because I'm wearing a number, Arnie. And he said, I know, and I'm proud of you. Isn't that so great. That was Arnie, just, just so you haven't talked about it. Arnie Briggs was a little 50 year old guy who had run the Boston Marathon 15 times. And he was my coach, even though he wasn't a real coach, he was my buddy and he was the university mailman. So he used to come out and work out with the guys on the cross country team so he could get ready for the Boston Marathon every year. Wow. The thing I wanted to ask you about, because I, I come from, I'm younger and I come from a time when I'm much more aware of women being out there and doing marathons and ultra marathons and all sorts. So I have to try and take my mind and put it back in 1967 and try and imagine what the culture was like. Um, can you just say a word on what, what that culture was like, the fact that it was such a big thing for a woman to go into a marathon? Was it just generally accepted by men and women alike that that's not something that women do? Was that just sort of culturally pervasive? Was that sewn into the culture of both America and the world? Did other women look and go, why would you do that? Yeah, actually, the culture was worse than that because the culture was a culture of fear and protectiveness. And so, you know, this was straight, six, 1967 was j the advent of the, the second great wave of uh, the women's liberation movement. The first being the suffrage movement at the mm. turn of the century. Yep. And this was um, a time when we were protesting of equal pay, right to choose, equal education. I mean, things that we take for granted now. With sports, it was widely assumed that if a woman was going to participate in sports, she either had to be slightly masculine, maybe turn into a lesbian. Um, <laughs> um, her uterus was going to fall out if she did anything arduous because women were supposedly weak and fragile. And I just didn't understand that because my ancestors were pioneers in America. And, uh, and, and anybody who's ever had a baby knows <laughs> that, that it is not an easy thing to do. So how possibly could people think women were weak and fragile? So, but it was, it was suspect. And also women doing anything arduous and looking strained or sweating was just not socially acceptable. I mean, we had to kind of keep our appearance. So I just thought it was all hooey because I didn't understand why a woman couldn't do both. Why can't you do something arduous and you can still be feminine? What's, it, what's, what's the problem here? Mm -hmm. and, and, um, but anyway, the, the situation was one of both protection and also a myth where, you know, you, you, you're going to get big legs if you do this. You're going to grow hair on your chest or something. Mm -hmm. so, so women were naturally afraid of getting involved in sports, even if they maybe liked the activities when they were kids. Long about 12 or 13, they decided they'd better give it up because they didn't want something bad to happen to them. And I found uh, running when I was 12, when my dad helped me run a mile a day, 
because he saw an insecure kid and he thought if I made the field hockey team in my high school, that, that I would, um, you know, I'd have something to hang my hat on. And um, actually it was the running a mile a day, not only to get in shape for this team, but gave me a sense of real empowerment. Mm. Um, you know, almost a victory under my belt, nobody could take away from me. And I swear to God, you know, I've been running what, 60 years now. It's, um, it's true. It does give you a victory under your belt every day. And yeah, uh, the day is always better if I get the run in, no question. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah. It sounds like your father was a wonderful person. I loved the story that you'd gone to him talking about maybe doing some cheerleading. And then yeah. could you just not yeah. being a person on the sidelines, but being someone participating? Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, every little girl wants to be pretty and popular. And, and I did too. And so I told my dad I wanted to be a cheerleader when I went to high school the next year. And he said, oh, honey, you don't want to do that. He said, cheerleaders cheer for other people. You want people to cheer for you. Life is to participate, not to spectate. And I thought, wow, what a concept. <laughs> you know, I had never thought of it that way. You know, you, you, mm. you see kids see what's around them and what they think will lead to something. And boy, I, I love I love telling that story. And I'm glad that you asked it because um, I not only do that to honor my parents who were incredible parents, um, but also it's our moral responsibility as adults to give kids every opportunity in the world to find their own heroism they get their noses broken so easily at a very early age. And it's so easy to give them a sense of empowerment by telling them, you can do it, you're worthy. Luckily, I grew up with that and, and it changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. You know, um, the running, of course, empowered me, but it was there empowering me that helped me start running. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they sound like wonderful people. I uh, want to take you back a moment, Catherine, to the to the race day. So you're in the race, um, you're running down the road. And of course, the infamous images take place. There is uh, some some video as well. You talked about how you the first you're aware of it, you hear the leather shoes, he grabs you and turns you around. The big question I had was, do you feel now what at the time seems like this moment of negativity? Do you now look back and feel quite grateful towards Jock and that incident because of ironically, his attempt to stop what was happening ended up only boostering it far bigger than anyone could ever have imagined. Absolutely. I, absolutely. You know, I, I always say that the worst things in your life can become the best things. I made a big speech about this last night for our 261 Fearless webinar series. Fear can really work for you. And at the time, of course, I was terrified. I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. I was, you know, what was I going to do? I made the decision to finish the race, which was the most important thing. No matter what, I was going to finish the race. I decided that. But what gave me the courage to make that decision was the fact that I had already been running for eight years. You know, I, I knew that, that I was trained. I was ready to go. I could finish it. I'd run 31, you know, 50 Ks in practice, 31 miles in practice. But yeah, every day I thank Jock Semple for attacking me in the race because he not only changed my life and gave me the clarity for the, my future, what I wanted to do. But he also gave not only the women's rights movement, but the civil rights movement, one of the greatest photographs in history. <laughs> it was Jock Semple for all of his feistiness and, and bad temperedness and cantankerousness and everything, really was a major player in helping preserve the marathon because people in Boston wanted it to go away. It was a pain for them. But Jock hung in there and it was his baby. Mm. And that's what pissed him off so much about me because he thought I was wrecking his race. He thought I was a phony and a fraud. Right. And I was trying to convince him that I was the real item. Jock wasn't ready for that. But really, by the time I got to Heartbreak Hill, you know, 21 miles, 35 Ks, you can't stay mad anymore. I, I gave up being mad at Jock and I said, he's a product of his time. They'll just put him aside, but we've got to move on. And I've got to create these opportunities for women because other women don't, don't believe they can do this. He did give me the vehicle to, to move forward the story might have become a myth in, in running history or one of the odd quirky things that happened in running history, but the photographs have become increasingly galvanizing over the years. Mm. And, um, and even now, you know, they've become like sort of this flashpoint in history. So, you know, it's important what you do with these things and, and hopefully I am carrying this forward, but, but indeed I even went to visit Jock just a few hours before he died and people say, Whoa, that's a lot of forgiveness. And I, I said, 
hey, listen, first of all, we became best friends like five years after this incident, okay? And, and would do speaking things and interviews like this together. And we never agreed. We were always like this. But when I visited him um, before he died, um, it was really an important visit because um, it was an acknowledgement that, that he, in his own way, had changed my life and therefore changed the world. Hmm. So, hey, you know, you, no matter what, you've got to love people who help you do that. And I love Jacques dearly. And he was, he was a lovable character when he wasn't angry. <laughs> but oh, he was course. angry a lot of the time. <laughs> Tony spoke to me about that temper. He talked about how he was, uh, yeah, quite a feisty person. It's amazing that in the end, he was this fantastic and generally positive force. But in that moment on that day, he had to sort of embody the opposite, really. As you say, the image is so powerful and uh, he had to take, take that role. I guess it's fair to say from that moment on, your life is a bit different because, you know, the, the headlines come out. You must have seen the photo in the paper and thought oh this is they, they took a photo of this moment and this is probably quite a, did it did it dawn on you at the time that something quite big had happened or did it take a while to, for it to sink in how big this story was at the time we thought he was just an overworked race director on a bad day when he's trying to get the race <laughs> off on time and he just lost his temper just lost mm. it just completely lost because he was out of control he was wow. out of control and my boyfriend of course decked him <laughs> so anyway but at the time you know we were running along afterwards and we said god what what is wrong with that guy and, and Arnie, my coach, said, I've known him for years. He's always had a bad temper. I'm never going to speak to him again in my life. He was just, this is it. This is the thing. Always pushing people around. La, 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 la. We fobbed it off. And, and when you know, the race was over, we went, went and got finally a, some food and a shower and, and a beer. <laughs> and, and in the car on the way home, we were talking about it. And we just thought, well, that's a one-off crazy deal. And it wasn't until midnight when we stopped, you know, had to stop the car uh, to get gas and to get some coffee to stay awake and some ice cream to keep going and stretch our legs. And in the cafe on the motorway, we saw the newspapers. And in those days, you have to understand that, that newspapers were everything. You know, Boston had seven different newspapers and they had like three editions a day. So there were newsstands wow. are filled and you could just look at the, the news rack there in the cafe by that time. And you could see the pictures everywhere on all of those papers. And I said, oh, my God. And we grabbed the papers and we looked at them. We all looked at each other and the boys were going, Aah! you know, <laughs> and, and I was saying, my God, my life is going to change. So it did. It absolutely changed my life. It was a defining moment already. I knew I was going to have to change the system and mm. I didn't know how that looked. And I also knew I, I had to become a better athlete. And I knew how that looked. That was going to be a lot of training because I, I ran four hours and 20 minutes. Yes. And that was considered a jogging time in those days. Okay. Mm. And so I was pillory for being a jogger that the race shouldn't allow people in who run four hours and 20 minutes, even though I was far from last. Jock Semple went and had a press conference the next day and said, I could have walked it that fast. You know, it was really Blimey. demeaning. And so I said, okay, to hell with it. I'm going to show you. I'm going to be a good athlete. And I trained my brains out and I got my time down to 251 and everybody shut up. Okay. Cause a 251 in 1975 was a pretty damn good time. But my bigger focus was really on trying to create opportunities for women. So at the time, we thought it was a one-off deal. By midnight, I knew it wasn't. Mm. And then it was a process of years of work, step by step, to make the changes happen. And it wasn't easy. I mean, I got hate mail from the religious right saying, you know, as a woman, you should be at home making dinner for your husband. Wow. You're going to fry in hell. Just incredible. You're going to get such, such polarized opinions, I guess. It was. It was, it, was a pol it was a polarizing time. But again, it was an amazing vehicle. Sometimes, you know, when, uh, especially right now in COVID-19, in this time, we, we have a situation where a lot of people are paralyzed with fear. If they really look at a, the bad situation, like I had to look at that, what happened to me in the Boston Marathon, because I was also expelled from the Athletic Federation, you know, for, for running with men. <laughs> oh, and I was DQ'd from the race because, wow. you know, I had, I had fraudulently entered the race and I ran without a chaperone. I mean, it was insane. But anyway, you take that bad situation and you turn it around like this and you say, well, what's going to make this right? Because there's always an opportunity when there's something wrong that you can make, right? It's a matter of creating opportunities for people. So I started small with a little club in Syracuse, New York, which grew huge. And it got to be the second biggest running club in New York outside of the New York Roadrunners. Wow. We bid for national championships. I learned how to get sponsorship. I wrote lots of press releases. 
then I started working on major sponsorships and I started then working with the women and we got women official at Boston in 72. Amazing. It still took five years to get women officially into Boston. Marathon. Five years. That's a big I amount of time. And you know what? By that time, the media was all over this because right. the women were running around three hours in a marathon yeah. mm. back in, you know, back in the 1970. How much talent exists out there that we're not giving the opportunity to? Nobody's going to take it seriously unless we're in the Olympic Games. Well, of course, you know, people thought I was smoking poppy when I was talking about that. <laughs> we were talking about that in 1972. Mm. We organized the first ever women's road race in New York. Um, we had 78 women turn up to, who could run 10,000 meters. Are you kidding? Run a 10K? It was huge. It was network news again. I had a lot of help from the IAAF headquartered in London. I moved to London in 1980 for the year. Uh, well, the summer anyway to organize a big women's marathon in London. And it was going to be the game changer to convince the Olympic Committee to get the women's marathon in the Olympic Games because they said we needed 23 countries and um, three continents. Mm. And we had 27 countries and five continents. So they couldn't dismiss us anymore on the international representation. But at the last moment, the Russians in particular said, we don't have enough medical evidence. And I was expecting that. So we had, in fact, gotten supportive medical evidence all along. Doctors, mostly who were runners, who proved quite surprisingly, even to them, that women actually excelled at distance and that the marathon was probably a lot more ideal for them than the 100 meters of the shot put. So with that evidence and the support of the LA uh, OOC, Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee, we met with uh, the board of directors and they voted in the women's marathon in 1981 in an extraordinary meeting for the 1984 games. So wow. you have to thank Jock Semple for attacking me in the Boston Marathon, for giving me the push. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't have been quite so fired up about it if I hadn't have been attacked in the race. So it had a really um, happy ending, even beyond the Olympics. It's beyond running. It's a social revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been overwhelmingly positive and, and, and changing women's lives to the point where I've even created a, a nonprofit organization, a charity called 261 Fearless. I don't know if you can see behind me the, the bibs. I can named indeed, after 261. My, my bib number and then 261 Fearless. So we said, whoa, we better do something with this number. And I I didn't want to start a business, but I love the idea of a nonprofit. So fast forward, 261 Fearless is now in five continents, mm -hmm. 12 countries. We, we just went up a country yesterday. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah. And we offer an incredible education program and a club system around the world. It's very hard for women to, to do it by themselves, to go out the door and just to start running. They think everybody in the neighborhood is watching them and that they're slow and fat and that they you know, can't mm -hmm. do it anyway. When in fact, if you have a friend like I had Arnie, to just r run with me and jog with me. It chases the fear away and you feel like you can do anything. We're talking to them globally. So watch his face, watch his face. Absolutely, Catherine. <laughs> and how fantastic that running is. It, running is such a fantastic vehicle for that message as well. It's so, as it you is. made a comment earlier, you said it sort of almost surpasses sport. And I totally agree with that. It's sort of, people sometimes refer to it as a sport. I've even referred to it as a sport on this podcast on Jog On. And I kind of even feel a little bit like, mm, it's not quite a sport though. It's almost, it's something beyond a sport, you know? No, it's, it's bigger a movement. Than that. It is a movement, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject. And amazing to picture you back in 1967, all that time back, having that number pinned to you. And at the time, you must have thought nothing of, oh, this is a, my number I'm getting for the day. And yet that 261 has come to represent so much. And it's amazing how these things blossom. And the Olympic moment must have been a very proud moment. It was one of those <gasps> breathtaking moments. I think to me, the, the most amazing thing was the moment when Joan came into the Olympic Stadium. And forgive me, because people have probably heard me say this a million times. But when she came into the stadium, we didn't. We decided we weren't going to do any voice. We we're going to let the crowd take it. It was overwhelming the sound of 95,000 people. Overwhelming. And to me, that that moment was as important as giving women the right to vote. The vote was about our in 1920 in the United States anyway. It was about our social and intellectual acceptance. But this was like the physical acceptance. I mean, the Olympic marathon is the toughest race for men or for women. And it was like leveling the playing field. And here were women running it in brilliant times with grace and speed, courage, and representing everything that was great. To me, it was as important as giving the right to vote because around the world, not just the 95,000 people in the stadium, but there were 2.2 billion people around the world who were watching it. And everybody knows how far 26 miles, 385 yards, or, or 42.2 kilometers is. Mm. 
I mean, even in the poorest country, they've walked it or ridden a donkey or a bike over the distance. They know it's far. So I just thought that's it. That's the most amazing thing. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I'd like to just tag this with is like, I really love people who run especially, but it's never too late to start. Just run all your life. It's the best thing you can do. The happiest day of my life was April in 2017 when I ran the Boston Marathon again for my 50th anniversary. And it was mm. brilliant to be surrounded by 13,500 women, half of the race, all wearing bib numbers, imagining how it was 50 years before being the only woman wearing a bib number. Absolutely. So it, it's been an amazing, amazing evolution um, and, it, and it shall go on. So uh, I do think that running is the best thing we can do for ourselves. So everybody who's running, keep going. I've watched the video as you ran that um, on the 50th anniversary. You've actually pointed out roughly where the jock incident happened and you said that's that's where it was as you ran well, past Well, you know it. what? I'd been, I swear to God, I'd been back to, you know, I'd been back to Boston, you know, I'd done the broadcast for mm. 42 years. So, I mean, I've been there every year for 50 years. And um, and I'd gone out to Hopkinton a million times to try to find that pl place and I never could find it. Oh, really? Nothing quite worked. When I started running, instantly it came and I said this is it the media people with me and my my running partner said well let's do a Facebook live because the race has just started let's do something right now I said oh my god this is it this is this is the place and I just kind of said this is why and that went out and by the time we finished the race it had six million views wow. that that one piece I couldn't believe it. that's crazy that's it was amazing. it was a big it was a very big day for us it's funny that it took you to run it again to then all of a sudden isn't be put it? back. Isn't it? So that's how the jigsaw pieces came together. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that amazing? What an amazing life. Well, Catherine, brilliant. It's been fantastic. I, I still think, yeah, the image is, is a powerful one and one that will uh, continue through time. And uh, Jock Semple is this amazing sort of polarizing thing where he did something very bad and very good at the same time. And it only boosted the whole movement. And um, yeah, I, I just love the story. And I, thank you for your time. You're so welcome. Thank you for listening or watching this episode of Jog On. If you would like to help us out, you can recommend Jog On to a friend. To watch this episode, go to the YouTube channel Jog On Podcast with Harry Morgan. And if you would like to purchase a Jog On top to support the channel, you can email a size request to thisisjogon at gmail.com. I'm Harry. Go for that run. And this is Jog On.